right, uh, let's jump straight into it then. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, as I was already introduced, I'm Martin Brown. Uh, I'm an Android developer for Stream, uh, where we create uh, awesome, easy to use uh, chat SDKs for all platforms. Uh, our Android SDK is open source and Kotlin first. Uh, and if you need that kind of feature in your app, uh, then do check that out. I just realized I don't need my headphones. Uh, and so like just a quick thanks to the company for helping me be here today. Uh, let's get straight into our topic. So today I will talk about two open source libraries. Uh, one of them is going to be Crate and the other one is going to be Moshi. And then we'll eventually see how the two of them come together. So we're going to start with Crate, which is a library that I've created a while ago and I'm still maintaining it. And uh, this library is a wrapper around Android shared preferences APIs and it makes them easier to use. Uh, that's the uh, point of the library. So uh, let's jump into its code. On the code level, create is an interface and it's a super simple interface. It just has a shared preferences property in it. And you also get a class in the library called simple create, which makes it easier to implement this interface by extending the class. You can see that this takes a context as its parameter and then just gives you a default shared preferences uh, object for the um, context that you've passed in. The use site for create, so the client code, would look something like this. You would uh, create your own uh, create uh, object. Uh, sorry, someone's asking me to lower my mic volume. I can attempt to do that. Uh, how is it now? Is this any better? Okay, we're gonna roll with this then. Thank you, awesome. Uh, so uh, this is what the use site looks like. Um, so you're extending simple crate, uh, which is the easiest way to implement the crate. And then you're adding each property that you want to store uh, and delegating each of them into functions that are provided by the crate library. So uh, this gives you this kind of syntax when you actually go ahead to use your crate. Uh, you just read and write values of properties in the same way as you would if these were real boolean or int values. But under, under the hood, these are all going to be stored in shared preferences instead. So let's take a look at what implementing one of these would look like and how these work under the hood. We're going to go with just one of them. Uh, as all of the other ones are similar, we're going to implement the one that stores ints. And we're going to go with this syntax at first, where we are clearly delegating the property into an instance of this int delegate class. This class will take a parameter, a key that it will use for storing things in shared preferences. And we're going to make it implement a interface called readwrite property which is a standard library interface. So it comes from the Kotlin standard library and it has two methods that we have to implement, get value and set value. Now using this interface is not mandatory if you're creating delegates, but it does make things a lot easier. So I recommend doing it anyway. You can see that this interface has two type parameters. One of them specifies where this delegate may be used. So by putting in create here, uh, what we're saying is that this uh, delegate will only be available for properties that are inside of a crate. Uh, the other type parameter will be the type of the property that we're implementing. In this case, we want to uh, support storing ints. So this is going to be just int. You can see that this is what get value will return and what set value will receive as its last parameter. Inside get value and set value, uh, the first parameter will be the containing create instance. So uh, we get the uh, create that our delegate is being used inside of as the first parameter in each of these functions, which means that we can use that to grab a shared preferences and then inside get value, uh, use get end to grab the val value from shared preferences and return that. This is what will happen when someone reads the value of the property. And then inside set value, we start an edit on shared preferences. We put in the int associated with the key that we have, and then we apply our changes to finish this up. This is already a working implementation, and we could already ship this. And uh, the use site code would use site code would just create instances of int delegate manually. But create cleans this up by introducing an intermediate uh, layer, which is a factory function, which only 
takes uh, the same parameter that the class takes as well and just creates an instance of the class but this lets you hide the class itself as an implementation detail as the factory function returns the interface type also this extent this uh, factory function is an extension on crate which means that it will only be available to you when you are writing code inside of a crate and not anywhere else so we're not polluting the global namespace with this uh, we are making sure that um, this will only show up in auto completion results if you're writing code in the correct context inside of a crate so this would simplify our uh, use site to this which was the original syntax that we were going for that's a brief intro to crate and all the other types would work very much the same way so uh, we would have a boolean pref and uh, a long pref and so on and with that we can now move on to moshi which is a serialization library and again i just want to give you a quick intro to this library first moshi uh, has been described as gsmv3 and everything but name i'm stealing this description from a reddit comment by jake wharton uh, but the point is that moshi really uh, aims to improve on things that json didn't quite get right uh, while at the same time feeling familiar to anyone who's used json before to make it easy to migrate and start using moshi moshi is part of a group of libraries uh, by square the ok group of libraries so uh, things like uh, OKIO, OK HTTP, and Retrofit uh, would be uh, in this uh, group and all of these libraries work really nicely together. Moshi also has a streaming API, uh, which is awesome. Uh, you can uh, do streaming parsing using Moshi and custom adapters and things like that. And all of these libraries work, again, very efficiently together. Uh, they share buffers under the hood. You can be parsing data while it's coming in from the network and so on. Uh, there's an entire talk about this uh, by Jake Wharton from almost like five years ago, more than five years ago now, uh, which describes all of this in uh, great detail. I think this talk alone will convince you to start using all of these libraries together because it's just really neat how they fit together. Uh, getting to Moshi's APIs. Moshi has a very good sense of nullable values in Kotlin. If we create a class like this burger, which has a name and description, and as you can see, both of these are regular uh, non-null strings, and then we go ahead and create a Moshi instance and grab an adapter from that uh, Moshi instance, then we can attempt to parse uh, strings into burgers now. So here's a JSON string which contains a burger, but it only has a name and doesn't specify a description. If we try to run this code and parse this using Moshi, we will get a really nicely worded exception, which says that there was a required description value at the root of the object that was missing. So Moshi makes sure that if something's not null, then that value will be treated as required and you'll fail fast if you um, have a JSON which is invalid. Of course, Moshi also understands nullable types. So if we make this description nullable, then suddenly we can parse this string that only has a name in it. And in this case, description will be set to null, which is OK since we are forced by the Kotlin type system to handle this later on anyway. Let's go on to default parameter values, which is also something that Moshi recognizes. We can again just use this same class and provide a default description for all of our burgers in this case. If we don't know anything else about our burgers, we're just going to assume that they're yummy. That's a fair assumption. So if we again try to parse the same JSON, you will now see that Moshi uses the default value for the description uh, correctly. Moshi can be used in a couple different setups, and I won't show you the Gradle configuration for these, but it can be used with code generation, with reflection, or both of them. The code that you see now on the right hand side is the code generation setup. That's what the generate adapter through option specifies. With this setup, there will be an adapter generated for the burger class at compile time. And uh, this will be picked up by the Moshi Builder that we're creating. You can see that this doesn't require any configuration. These generated adapters are automatically added to each Moshi instance. You can, however, also go the reflection route. In this case, you don't need that annotation, but you do need to add a adapter factory to Moshi, which will use Kotlin-based reflection to create and uh, serialize Moshi, uh, sorry, uh, model objects. And you can also go with a mix of these. If you have the reflection-based adapter factory set up, but you also generate adapters for some classes, then those generated adapters will be used first if they are available, 
And for the models that don't have adapters, Moshi will fall back on the reflection-based approach instead. One nice thing about Moshi and that I really like is that it always calls the constructors of each class that it creates, regardless of whether you use re reflection or code generation. Uh, while you shouldn't really have side effects and custom initialization logic in uh, DTOs that you are going to serialize, this is still handy as it prevents a lot of uh, unexpected behavior that might occur with other serialization libraries that just use reflection directly uh, and don't invoke um, constructors. And of course, let's take a moment to talk about uh, the name of the library. Well, there's a place in Kilimanjaro that's called Moshi. That's not what the library is named after, uh, as this uh, GitHub issue says. Instead, it's named after a dog that Jake used to have. So let's just go to that tweet that was linked there and take a brief moment to appreciate the dog that uh, the library was named after. OK. So uh, when you create a library, uh, like I did, where you can store data in it, people are eventually going to start asking you to store complex data in it. Uh, with shared preferences, it's a usual practice to serialize strings into JSON and put them into shared preferences like that. This is not the best idea in general, and I can't uh, emphasize this enough. So I want to put up a disclaimer here where you should really consider just using a database or perhaps even a file instead of uh, deciding to store complex data like this in shared preferences. If you need that data to be indexed, to be interpreted, if you need to, be, uh, need to query parts of that data, then you really need a database and not uh, a string sh stored in shared preferences. But if you know what you're doing and you're storing small amounts of data and you know that you only need that data as one entire blob of, uh, of an object, then shared preferences in some cases really is the easiest and well best way to go as it's just really super simple to store something in there. So with that uh, disclaimer in mind, uh, let's see uh, how we can store custom data in Crate. And initially, the requests uh, for storing custom data in the library were all about JSON. And I was also using JSON back then, so that's what I implemented at first. I no longer recommend that you use either this JSON-based delegate or JSON itself in a Kotlin project. But we're going to look at it as we can learn a bit uh, from its implementation, and we can also reuse it later on. So let's see how this now sort of deprecated JSON delegate implementation works. We're going to do everything that we've seen before with the int base delegate immediately. We're going to start off with the factory function this time, which extends create, creates a read-write property, and the implementation class is something called JSON delegate, which will look like this. It will take the key as a parameter and again implement the read-write property interface so that it can be used as a delegate. For the get value and set value methods, we now have to return something of type t and we'll receive something of type t as the last parameter of set value uh, because we are creating a generic class. And inside get value, we're going to uh, do the deserialization. So I'm creating an instance of JSON here, grabbing a string from shared preferences, and then using json.fromjson to parse that string back into a model object. That uh, type uh, that I want to parse from the string is specified here using the uh, JSON type token API. On the other method, so in set value, we're again creating a JSON instance. This is done in a slightly nicer way in the library. I'm simplifying the code so that it fits on the slides. Uh, but we're grabbing a JSON instance from somewhere. We're starting an edit. We serialize the model into a string, put it into shared preferences, and apply the changes. And this looks like a reasonable implementation of a JSON-based delegate at first. Uh, but if we were to start using this, we would soon see errors popping up all over the place. Uh, errors such as this one. What we see here is that we were trying to cast a JSON internal type called a linked tree map, so a map of something, into whatever custom model uh, I was trying to store in shared preferences. And the problem here, um, it will turn out, is with the implementation of our get value method, where we try to parse the string back into this custom model type. The way that I specified this was using the JSON type token API, which is not really meant to be used with generic types. And the reason why you shouldn't use it with generic types is type erasure, which is a feature of the JVM where the concrete values of generic type parameters 
are not available to you at runtime. You can think of this as all of the generic type parameters being erased into just being the object type instead, uh, wherever they're used. So I wasn't telling JSON to give me something of type T, which was whatever custom model uh, I was trying to store in this delegate. I was telling JSON to give me an object, any arbitrary object, that matches the string uh, that I've passed in alongside this type token. So that's what JSON did. It fell back to this default implementation, uh, which created a map that contains the JSON data in some form, but that's not our own custom model and that's not really what we want. Thankfully, Kotlin has a solution for exactly this issue, which is losing type information at runtime uh, when it comes to generics, and it's called reified generics. So if we add the reified keyword to a type parameter, the concrete real value of that type parameter will be available for us to use. Uh, this is a compile time trick which uses inlining, so this is only available in inline functions, which is why I added this modifier to the type parameter of the factory function and not the class itself. And with that assumption that this reified keyword really does magically fix things, uh, we can create the type token out there in the factory method while we still have the uh, correct type information and pass in the type that it produces as a parameter to JSON delegate and use that type when we parse stuff from strings into objects. So with this fix in place, if we were to try using this delegate in practice, then it really would work correctly. But with all the trouble that we had, it's really time that we think about testing this implementation with like actual real tests uh, that we can run again and verify easily. Let's see what testing create delegates will look like. And it will be, I think, surprisingly straightforward. We need a model to store. So here's a dummy test model, which has a bunch of different types of properties in it. Then we need a crate as our delegates can only be used inside of crates. Uh, I'm naming this one JSON test crate. I'm again using simple crate to have a very um, concise implementation. And I'm adding two properties here, which I'm gonna serialize using JSON. One of them is just one instance of test model, and then the other property can store a list of test models just to have that more complex case covered with tests as well. Then for the test itself, we can create an instance of JSON test crate. This requires a context parameter, so this either has to be an instrumented test or we have to use RoboElectric for it. But um, this is the simplest uh, code that we can test with. We could also mock the shared preferences uh, interface if we were doing a more manual implementation and not using simple crate. But again, this is the simplest and more, more, uh, most straightforward approach to this. And then the test is nearly trivial at this point. We have to create a test model. We grab our crate, we write the model value into the crate, and then we immediately read it back and just check that we are getting the same value after we wrote it and read it uh, back. Because this uh, puts us through a serialization and then a deserialization cycle. So we're going back and forth and testing uh, that everything remained the same along the way. And if we run this test with our now fixed implementation, this test will pass and we can also uh, check the list of values, so the other property, where we would create um, uh, this time around a couple different uh, pieces of test model with some random data in it. Again, put that into crate, uh, grab it from crate and see that we still have the same value. And this test again would uh, work successfully and it would pass. So uh, that's our uh, side note of covering JSON and how uh, testing crate might be done. And with all of that out of the way, it's time to get back to our title and bring the two libraries and that this talk is really about together. So let's now see how we can integrate Moshi with Crate. And since we have this JSON-based delegate, this will be very uh, quick to get started with. We can just grab the existing implementation and rewrite it so that it uses Moshi instead of JSON. We can first rename the class so that it's called Moshi Delegate. Then we can go into get value and instead of creating a JSON instance, we can grab an adapter from Moshi and use that adapter to parse the string. And the same in set value, we can just grab an adapter for the type that we have and use to JSON to serialize uh, that into a JSON string. Finally, we would have to update the factory function. Uh, we can call it Moshi pref this time. And of course, we wanna make sure that it creates an instance of the Moshi delegate class, which we now have here. There is one issue with all of this rewriting of JSON code. Uh, 
which is the type token that we've created earlier. So this type token is a class that comes from JSON. It's a JSON API. And in order to use this in our Moshi-based implementation like this, we would have to depend on JSON and pull in all of JSON's code into our project when we are really just using Moshi, which really wouldn't make any sense. So the question now is, what can we do to create a type here that we can pass in that is going to uh, then uh, be used by Moshi to determine what kind of adapter it has to use? And in order to find out what we can pass in here, uh, let's first talk about what a type is. Uh, in fact, let's take a step back and talk about what a class is, as in the class class, I mean the java.lang.class class, which is kind of funny to talk about uh, because all of these words are pronounced the same way, um, but hopefully you can follow along. So class is a Java reflection type which, if you look at its documentation, uh, represents classes and interfaces in a running Java application. So you can use this to uh, inspect the structure of your code and describe a class itself. Uh, you can get an instance of class by calling getClass on any in-memory object, or uh, by reading the Java class extension property if you're in Kotlin. Uh, this is a uh, different syntax, but it translates to the same call under the hood. Alternatively, uh, for a specific type that you know, uh, you can just write down something like string.class and that will give you a class object that represents the string class. Here are some examples of what getClass will return for uh, calling it on different kinds of objects. So on a hard-coded string, it will return the string class, of course. On an array list of strings, if you call getClass, that will give you a class that describes array list. And if you call it on an anonymous implementation of some interface, here we are creating this empty implementation of serializable, it will give you the class that describes the underlying generated class uh, for you. So here we see this dollar sign one, which is the first generated class within whatever class we're writing this code in. After you have an instance of class, you can call a bunch of methods on it. Uh, you can query its name in all sorts of different ways, and depending on what class you had, uh, this might yield uh, different formats. Um, so like pick between these um, wisely, um, depending on what you need. And you can also query a lot of things about the structure of the class. So you can check what interfaces it implements, what fields and methods it has. Uh, this is generally a really good entry point for all sorts of reflections. So you can use these fields to uh, make fields accessible, to write values into them. You can invoke methods uh, by name and so on and so on. I don't want to dive too deeply into that, but this is a general idea of what the class class is. And with that out of the way, we can now move on to type which is a interface and it's a, also part of the Java reflection tools. And this is a slightly newer uh, construct in the uh, JDK than class itself. And it's meant to represent all types in the Java programming language. So it's a broader thing than just class itself. Uh, it can represent role types, parameterized types, type variables, and so on. The interface itself is not very exciting. All it has is this get type name function. Uh, which just give you, gives you the name um, of the type as a string. But what's more interesting is the implementations of type. So class is actually one of its implementations, which is useful to know. And also there is a, another interface which extends type called parameterized type. And uh, this one can uh, clearly represent types that have parameters. For example, uh, for a list of strings, the get row type uh, function would give you the list type back, while the get actual type arguments function would give you an array of types which would have the string type in it. So you can query things like the contained type parameters for parameterized type using this interface. Both of these things are Java reflection utilities. And to sum them up very, very succinctly, class has generally no idea about generics. Well, type has support for generics through the parameterized type interface. But we also have Kotlin reflection tools, as the Java-based ones can't really express everything that happens in Kotlin uh, with all the special constructs in Kotlin that straight up don't exist in Java. So we also have things like K-Class. And if we look at K-Class, it really is just the Kotlin-based variant of the class class. So you can grab one of these by using the double colon class syntax in Kotlin. Uh, 
and you can do this both for objects and type names and then you can query a bunch of things yet again so you can check what members there are in the class you can check the name in different formats um, you can if it's a sealed class for example uh, you can see that there's some kotlin specific things here if it's a sealed class you can check what subclasses it has uh, you can grab the visibility of the class which as you can see here on the last line is a k visibility which is useful because it can uh, have information in it like internal visibility which you wouldn't be able to express in java reflection tools because that visibility just doesn't exist there and you can also just check a bunch of boolean things on a class so whether it's a sealed class a data class whether it's a companion object uh, and my personal favorite is the, again the last one here which is whether the class is fun or not one useful thing to know about k-class is that if you have a k-class you can go from there to a java class by using the java extension property on it so whenever you have an api that's java based and expects a java class as a parameter then you are probably using something like string.class uh, uh, to pass in uh, as the parameter's value while in kotlin you can do the same thing by using string class java instead which again is first uh, fetching a k class and then converting that into a regular java class and if we come back to this table of sorts, we see that there is one slot conspicuously empty here. So of course, there's also something called k-type, which is uh, Kotlin's version of a type. So while type needed this parameterized type subtype to represent parameters and had these uh, two properties for the row type and the type arguments in there, k-type has these natively. It has a classifier and then it can have several arguments, uh, which are again further types. And because this is a Kotlin reflection type, it also has things like whether the type is nullable or not, as that's a core part of Kotlin's type system. So we learned a bit about all of these classes and types that we see here. Uh, so now let's go back to our Moshi Delegate implementation and see how we can get to where we want to get. Uh, this is the code that we had. We have the correct implementation for the class. We need to pass in a type and all that we have to go on is the reified t type parameter. One thing we could do based on what we've just seen is to do this. Uh, we could grab the k class from the type parameter, convert it into a Java class and we now know that that's also a type so this is valid to pass in and we could try and see if this works. It's worth noting that this only works because we have a reified type parameter so if you have a regular type parameter that's not reified then you couldn't call uh, class on it uh, again because the type information just wouldn't be there anymore at runtime but in this case it is there the way to test this would of course be to just run some tests but the tests we have so far are json based so let's just convert these to moshi tests as well and this is going to be super simple we just use moshi pref instead of um, the json pref function for each of our properties and we make sure that we are creating a test crate that's based on moshi which is the one that we have here and the code of the test doesn't change uh, we just run this uh, same code write a value read the value and with the approach that we have so far this test passes so we can be quite happy about this but of course we also had this other test that i was just adding for um, like um, an additional test case but really in the case of the moshi based implementation this test is more than useful as this test will fail so there's something wrong when we try to put a list of values into moshi using the type that we passed in uh, earlier and this is the error that we would get we can see that we were expecting to get back an array of our own custom test models but what we actually got were an array or sorry a list uh, of some other objects which also hold the same values but are not instances of our class so what are these objects then uh, to find this out we can go into the de debugger and just uh, check uh, at runtime and what we'll see here is that these are instances of something called linked hash tree map which sounds very complicated but this is just a map type from moshi uh, again this is a moshi internal type just like we've seen some of the internals of json earlier on and uh, this type uh, is uh, created by moshi here because it can't quite figure out that we want uh, our own test models to be created uh, 
let's see why that happens. Uh, this is the syntax that we used. We had a reify type parameter. We grabbed the K class and went to a regular class from there. Uh, one of our tests passed, one of them failed. The test that passed uh, had the type parameter of test model. And if we evaluate the expression that's highlighted on the top, then we would get a type that describes test model. So here we were telling Moshi to give us a test model and Moshi did that correctly, so our test succeeded. But in the other case, we were grabbing the class and then the Java class from a list of test models. And as class doesn't have support for generics, uh, we were just uh, passing in a type to Moshi, which was describing the list interface. So we asked Moshi to give us a list of something, but we didn't tell us what to put in that list. So Moshi used this default approach of just putting all of the data into maps and putting those maps into a list. So that's not good. Um, what else can we do then? Uh, surely Moshi supports serializing lists of things. That seems like a very obvious uh, feature to have. And of course, Moshi does support this. Uh, the regular API for uh, creating a type uh, which describes a list would look something like this. This comes from Moshi. If you call new parameterized type and pass in two uh, simple classes to it, then this will give you the, the combined type out of the two. So you're going to get a type that accurately describes a list of test models. However, we cannot use this API in our case as we have a generic type parameter and we can grab a class from that, but we can't extract the uh, nested type inside it. And we're not even sure that it only has a single nested type. This generic type parameter could be quite complicated. Um, so really this API is just not useful to us. So we're back to square one. We don't have anything to pass in here to specify the correct type. Um, so what else can we try? Uh, what if we went back to the initial JSON based approach? What, what if we use the JSON type token approach? But again, we don't want to add JSON as a dependency. So what if we tried just stealing the implementation that we really need out of the type token class and seeing if, if that's plausible. So we want to be able to use just this specific uh, part of JSON's type token. The type token class has a bunch of things in it, and we definitely don't need all of them. But here's the uh, simplified version of the type token class and uh, just the parts of it that we actually use when we use that syntax on the top of the slide. So there's a constructor here, which is good. We're creating our own anonymous object, which extends type token. So we need this constructor. And then what we're doing is we're grabbing the type out of this newly created object. And type is a field inside type token, which gets computed by running the get superclass type parameter function and passing in the result of get class. Interestingly, get class here will return the class that describes our newly created object and not type token itself. So get class will return a class that describes the subclass of type token that we created. And we can see this reflected in the name of the parameter in the function. It's just called subclass. Inside there, there is a single call, which is the uh, magic behind the entire type token approach in JSON, which is this get generic superclass call. If we look at the documentation for this, this returns a type and the documentation says that it returns a type representing the direct superclass of the entity represented by this class. So this class now is the object that we are creating, which extends type token. So the direct superclass will be type token itself. So we're going to get a type here, which describes type token. The documentation goes on to say, though, that if the superclass is a parameterized type, which type token is, it had that T type parameter in it, then the type object returned must accurately reflect the actual type parameters used in the source code. So we have to get the type back here, which not only represents type token, but it has the correct information about the type that we passed into it, which is great, as that's exactly what we're trying to get at. And the way that this works is that, again, this function returns a type. And in the non-parameterized uh, case, so if the superclass does uh, not have a parameter, it's just going to give us the class for the superclass. But otherwise, it will give us an instance of parameterized type, which is an interface we've seen earlier. So after we make this call, we now have this type that uh, represents type token. We just make a quick check here to make sure that we didn't get a class. This would happen if you didn't pass in a value for the generic type parameter of type token, which you can do in Java, but you really shouldn't. Uh, 
And after that, we can safely assume that we now have a parameterized type. So we cast to that, we grab its type arguments, and we grab the first one, as we know that it only has a single one, and the value of that t type uh, parameter is what we are looking for. This is all good so far. This is like five to 10 lines of code. We could easily steal this from JSON and put it into our own library. But then the return value is wrapped into this canonicalize call. And if you look at the implementation of canonicalize in, uh, inside the JSON library, it refers to multiple classes in JSON, like four or five JSON classes, which then refer to a lot of other things in JSON. So if you had to pull in all of that, then we might as well be adding JSON uh, as a dependency at this point. But thankfully, canonicalize just reshapes the type a little bit, gets it into some canonical form that's useful for JSON. But we don't need that here. As you can see at uh, documentation, it returns a type that's functionally equal to the original type. So for our purposes, this is uh, just not needed, which means me that we can drop it and just go with this type token implementation. This, of course, is Java code, and we're writing a Kotlin-based library, so why would we bring Java into it? Uh, let's just do a straightforward conversion of this into Kotlin code. We're still doing the same thing, using generic superclass as the uh, core component of this solution. And since we are now in Kotlin, we might as well clean up the use site a bit. It's not convenient that to go from a generic t-type parameter to a Java type, you have to like create this weird object that subclass is type token and then grab something out of that. It's a lot nicer if we just wrap this into a function that handles all of this internally. So this make type function now creates the type token object as on its first line, and then it uses that type token to extract the uh, type information for the t type parameter. And on the use site up top, we can update it so that we no longer create the type token ourselves. We just call the make type function and pass in the t type parameter to it. And with this, we can now uh, put this into the implementation for our Moshi based delegate. And if we run our tests again, they will all pass now. So we can be quite happy with this. Now, I was almost done with the implementation of my library at this point, but then I kept looking around in the Kotlin standard library. And while I did have my own make type function, I discovered this type of function in there, which looks a lot like my make type function that I created. Uh, it takes a reified t type parameter and it gives you a k type, which uh, matches that t type parameter. So I was thinking, could I possibly use this instead of having to have my own implementation that's based on type token and just is custom code? And this doesn't quite work. On one hand, type of uh, was experimental back then, it still is. Uh, and it doesn't return a type, it returns a k type. So we can't pass this into Moshi directly. So then I needed a solution for going from a k type to a regular Java type. And thankfully, I found something else in the standard library, which is a Java type extension on a k type, which is very similar to how we could go from a k class to a regular Java class by calling the class extension on it. So I figured that I'm done here. I can get rid of make type. I have these two constructs. I create a K type and I go to a regular type and this should be all good. But then of course I ran the test to see that this worked. Again, super useful to still have those tests, which I now brought over from the original JSON implementation. They are, they are still producing value as I can uh, iterate on different things in my library. And the tests failed, uh, and they were failing with this error uh, that said that Java type was not yet supported for types created with create type. So this was back in maybe January of this year, uh, which means that I was on Kotlin 1.3. And so I was wondering what this create type function is. I never wrote down something like this in my code. And it turns out that this is just a function that type of uses internally. And this is what actually creates the K type that is returned from type of eventually. And you can quite clearly see that it had this exception hard coded into it. So type of was creating K types that could never be converted into a Java type. So at this point I gave up, I went back to my make type function and I shipped the library like this. But then uh, during the summer, uh, Kotlin 1.4 came out and type of was re-implemented. It's now a compiler intrinsic thing and it no longer uses create type internally, which means that if you're on Kotlin 1.4, you can actually finally do this. You can grab a type T and you can also convert this into a Java type if you need to. Uh, 
these two declarations here are still experimental, so you have to opt into this. Uh, but Create's newest version now uses these standard library APIs and no longer has the custom make type function that was kind of stolen from JSON back earlier. That's a wrap for today. So we covered a lot of things here, a uh, lot of code. I hope that you learned something about Kotlin and how types work and picked up a few small bits along the way. Uh, I do have some resources to recommend for you to check out uh, before we are done. Uh, I'm going to have a single link for all of these uh, on the next slide, but I just want to point them out individually real quick so that you know what to look for. First, of course, I would be happy if you checked out either of the libraries in the title. I think uh, more people using Moshi is great. And then, of course, Create is my own library, so I'm super happy for any feedback about it. If you have any issues with it, if you like using it, uh, please tell me about it. I also gave talks about both of these libraries earlier. Uh, last week, I gave a talk uh, at DroidCon Americas, which was about Create in more detail, covering how visibility control works in the library, how I got to the final implementation of its interface, and also some more details about the JSON-based delegate and how reify generics work. And then I also gave a talk about Moshi earlier, which is like a half an hour long intro to Moshi with some more about uh, how you can create custom adapters, more about uh, what options you have when you're using its API and so on. Uh, in this talk, we had a five minute intro to Moshi. So if you want a 30 minute one uh, before you're convinced, I think that's a great talk to watch. And also some related things from my blog to shout out. So I wrote a bunch about maintaining source and binary compatibility, which is really useful for library authors and also about controlling visibility, which is useful for libraries, but also super useful if you are just maintaining multi-module projects. And with that, we are done. Uh, again, to grab any of these resources or the slides themselves, uh, you can go to my website's talks page where you'll find all of these. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, I've also just tweeted this link. And I also tweet a bunch about Android and Kotlin there. So you can also find that and also contact me at any point after the talk if you have uh, questions about anything.